believe me when I say this, I am a direct, not an indirect, I'm a direct product of the work of Da'wat and Tabligh. There's this misconception that once people go into Jamaat and they become very sidetracked, one-sided, the brothers encouraged me to go. They didn't stop me from going. And Alhamdulillah, me talking to you now, I'm a product of that very effort. Mona Ilyas, Alhamdulillah, his maqsad was for the people to revive the effort of Iman within themselves. We're not negating everything else. We're saying that importance should be given to a very grassroots level of work. But here you have people opening up YouTube channels, making it their God-given whole day purpose just to slay other people. But you're not doing nothing productive in this ummah. So when people say, WG, but they don't take part in politics, or WGs don't do this, bruv, what do you do? What do you, you do it then? Honourable and respected brothers and elders, one of the things our life is based upon in this worldly life, or what we're trying to achieve is success in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Each and every person sitting here wants to achieve success. If you ask someone, why did you come to this country? Why did you come to UK? Per ultimately, everyone's jawab would be the same. I wanted to be successful. I, want, I wanted to get a, have a better life. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about success in the Quran al Kareem, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلِ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ Whoever is safeguarded from Jahannam and given Jannah, that person is successful. So what it is, is that each and every one of us wants to achieve that success. Keeping that in mind, Muslims throughout the ages, sometimes you've seen highs and lows of Muslims throughout the ages. After the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, we even in their zamana, we saw a lot of trials coming. The, the, the fitna and the qatl of Uthman, who was the Khalifa. Uh, I mean, there's like in Ali radiallahu anhu, the rise of the Khawarij, and you know, then you have Mu'tazilas and so on. There's been trials and things which have always come against the Muslims. Okay? So, we should never be despondent and never feel kind of halat and conditions will come, always. However, one of the things in the subcontinent, when I mean subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and I'm sure I think Sri Lanka was also part of, it was all one sort of big wide place, Al-Hind. If you pick up the, if you ever read history in Arabic, it refers to it as Al-Hind. There was a Mubarak person, mashallah, a very uh, genuine and very... Uh, Mashallah, godly individuals. Alhamdulillah, Mona Ilyasab, Rahmatullah in the subcontinent. Well, anyway, the halat and the condition was such is that Muslims had kind of assimilated and kind of resembled Hindus. Muslims had the, um, the Mughal Hukumat, which had lasted for, I think, Ghalib and approximately 800 years. And Muslims had ruled India. And then Muslims had lost this, and slowly, 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 what happened was is that Muslims started assimilating, meaning that you leave your Muslim culture and you start adopting someone else's. At large, this is happening ac happen across the globe. If you go towards, I mean, if you go in a lot of the Arab countries, Asian country, wherever it is, Asia Minor, Major, wherever it is, halat and the conditions are the same. If, it, 19, if you look back into 1947 and after partition, still, despite that subcontinent, whether it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they are still mental slaves of, a, of, of, of an English way of life. And what I mean by English, I'm not, you know, we're not against the whole sort of Western thing and Muslims are against, we're not that jahil, of course. I'm saying that there's a, still a mental slavery that exists in our communities that if, for example, someone perhaps is from a certain place or has a certain color of skin or something, then they are somehow superior. It's a colonialist mentality. And that's why Fair and Lovely Cream is the most selling cream in Pakistan. Fair and Lovely, because if you put the Fair and Lovely on, you, your skin bleaches and you become whiter. So it's the hottest selling cream because... If you use this, then you'll look, so to say, more English. So that's why, apparently, that equates to success. My point I'm mentioning is that the same condition, if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, Muslims were assimilating Hindus. And that's why in the subcontinent, towards the later of the 1800s, Muslims would have names like Muhammad Singh, Muhammad Ram. <laughs> you know, you can't have such names. It just doesn't, doesn't make sense. There are some cultural names like Bajwa, even Patel, that are used amongst Hindu and Muslim. That doesn't mean that it's exclusive for a religious type of people. But what happened was, is Muslims were losing their identity and taking on Hindu culture. There are a lot of things in that. Like, for example, now, when a mayyad dies, in, in Islam, we have three days of ta'aziyat. Ta'aziyat, meaning that to give condolences, is for three days. This whole concept of 40 days comes from a Hindu tradition, because they had a Hindu, that is part of the Hindu religion, that you, for 40 days, you constantly make a source and you lament and you kind of uh, shed tears over the, over the lost ones. And then where we go wrong as Muslims is we want to bring emotion into the equation and say, well, what's wrong with it? Because if someone's reading Quran, what's wrong with that? 
Are you saying you can't read Quran for 40 days? Okay, why not make it 30 days? Why 40? You see, because it has a resemblance. And man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. If you resemble a people, then that is ultimately a, it's an assimilation and you're like them then. So that's why we draw the line and we say, no, hold on. Lakum dinukum waliyadeen. We respect your right to differ, but we just don't want to practice upon it. And that's what I'm saying. It's not all doom and gloom and the West and what. We're not that stupid. Lakum dinukum. But if you like it that way, then you choose that way. We're not going to force our opinion on you. But as a Muslim, I have a right to make an informed decision. And my decision is, I want to follow Islam. Anyway, so the point I'm mentioning was that Muslims had kind of assimilated a worldly world view where they completely took Hindus' culture, Sikh culture, and they were very watering down the Islamic culture. It was Hazrat Ma Ilyas Abrahamdullah, not just him, but scholars before had this worry and concern that how can we bring Muslims back? And this was the birth uh, of, of, of the effort, which later on now comes to be known as Tabligi Jamaat or Jama'at Tabligh or Da'wan Tabligh, whatever you want to refer to it as. That's what it became known as afterwards. Because Hazrat Mawla Ilyas Abrahamdullah, after going on Hajj for the second time in 26, he came back and he had this, while he was there, he had this vision, this thought, this inspiration, call it whatever you want to call it, that he wants to do something to raise the Muslims out of darkness. So then, with the guidance of certain mashaykh, he then started this effort of what we now know, to, know as today as Da'wad and Tabligh. He himself never gave it a name. He wasn't trying to call people unto himself. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't a statesman. He wasn't a leader or a king. He wanted to bring alive the, the, the tahriq of iman within the people. And he said, people have started calling it tabligh jamaat. Otherwise, I would have called it tahriq iman. Tahriq meaning like a resurgence, a, a kind of um, a, a, an uprising, so to say, a movement about iman. I would have called it that, but I didn't call it anything. He then obviously... What, what one thing which the league has always given preference to is always going to one one person. So there's a zero you know, involvement in politics, zero relation to anything else other than one to one talking to people, bringing them back onto the path of deen. And Hazrat Ma'ilya used to have this slogan. He used to say in Urdu, he said, E Muslimano, Musliman Bano. Oh Muslims, become Muslims. Oh Muslims, be Muslims. That's the da'wah was. The whole maqsad of calling people was this. Now, just in case if anyone's, you know, why I even decided to talk about this, because a very senior figure from the Dawat and Tabligh effort, Haji Abdul Wahab Sahib, passed away just last week. Some of us may have heard his name. You know, whether you call it, you know, if, we're, if, we, if those especially from the subcontinent may have heard of his name. He never had a Facebook account, so you can't go and subscribe to him. He didn't have any YouTube channel or Twitter account, not even an email. Very simple, see, that's the guy. But when he was 16 years old, he was born in 1923. And when approximately by the age of when he was 1939, around about that sort of era, that's when he got connected with Malana Ilyas Abrahamdullah. He was born in Delhi, Karnal, in a place just near Delhi. And he got very attached to this work of da'wah from a very, very young age. And he was very active. And after the partition, he moved towards Pakistan. And the first Amir there was Shafiq Qureshi Shisab. And so I think it was about 1971. Then afterwards, it was uh, Haji uh, Bahu Bashir Sahib, Rahmatullahi, until about, I think it was about 92, if I'm not mistaken. And then afterwards, Haji Abdul Wahab Sahib became the Amir of the whole of the effort of Dawat and Tabligh in Pakistan. But this was one individual that selflessly, this is my point of mentioning this. First and foremost, I'm not here, I'm not going to, Muzaffar is not going to stand to do a tashkeel. We're not going to ask anybody, because those brothers from the subcontinent, the biggest ijtima in the world happens where? Anyone? No, Bangladesh. Biggest ijtima in the world. The Bishwa ijtima, Tongi ijtima is the big, they had to split it in half. The government said, can you split it in two please? This is causing mayhem, because more people would go to the ijtima than hajj. They have to divide it into two parts. It's such a big gathering, subhanAllah. Point I'm mentioning is that, you know, this is one effort that is not politically involved. Everyone has to spend their own money. How it spread so far and wide is just even mind-boggling. That how did it... Every, everyone, whether, whether you spend time or not, that's your business. I'm saying we all know what it is. Everyone here, I don't need to give you an introduction. We all know what the effort of Dawud and Tabligh is. So my point I'm mentioning is that you have these selfless individuals that have devoted their entire lives. And one of them was Haji Abdul Wahab Sahib, rahmatullahi He just passed away on the 18th of November. He was involved with the work of Tabligh for 79 years, 80 years, 80 years involved in the work of Da'wah and Tabligh. One is you say, I'm involved. And one is you're physically involved. Because after partition, when he moved to a, a place which I'm not 100% sure exactly, you know, the name of the village uh, is written somewhere, but I, I, f I forgot what it's called. But once he was there, he became what is known as a tahsil dar. You know, like he was like an administrative position. And he was quite a decent position. 
But then he got solely involved in the effort of da'wah tabligh and his whole life then became this cause. Such an extent, if anyone sat for his bayans, alhamdulillah, I had the privilege of sitting a number of times. He would give three hour bayans after Fajr. Three hour. Forget 20 minute Jumat taqreer, bhai. Three hour bayan. And he would say, Allah says, sab kuch hone ke yakin, or ghair Allah say, kuch na hone ke yakin. This is his da'wah. He used to talk only about this. Have the yakin, everything happened from Allah. Yani, la ilaha illallah. And nothing can happen from the, yani, from the creation. Yani, there's no qudrat and no power in anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was his da'wah, three hours. He would sit, and those of us who have sat there, I sat a couple of times, and during the bayan, he would fall asleep as well. Fall asleep five minutes, ten minutes, wake up and carry on exactly where he left off without even missing a word. You know, so Allah Jani, these individuals, their whole life was tabligh and whole effort was da'wah. But mashallah, these, why I'm, tr- I'm mentioning this on the Jummah platform is because number one, believe me when I say this, I am a direct, not an indirect, I'm a direct product of the work of Dawat and Tabligh. A direct product. There's this misconception that once people go into Jamaat and they become very sidetracked, one sided. No, Mona Ilyas, Alhamdulillah, his maqsad was for the people to revive the effort of Iman within themselves. But the, the Shabba of Deen is very wide. We're not negating everything else, we're saying that importance should be given to a very grassroots level of work. And hence, people like Mona Ilyas, Alhamdulillah, then after Mona Yusuf, Saab, Mona Inamul Hassan, Saab, and so on, they gave their whole lives for this one cause and they brought the Muslim Ummah onto this as well. So we are also encouraging the brothers everywhere that unfortunately what we have nowadays is we've broken up into small groups and factions. This is why one of the usul of tabligh, you don't talk about fiqh. You don't talk about anything fiqh or jurisprudence related. Because nowadays, uh, we, we separate masjids purely on the way you're tying your hands. If I say amin loudly, you're part of one group. If you say amin quietly, you're another group. So, and then we have divisions, so we have fiqhi, akhtalafat and so on. The thing we don't disagree with is la ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. We all agree on this. So let's agree to disagree on the other things, but let's agree on this. And that's exactly what the maqsad was. is to bring the ummah on one thing, islah, tahriq of iman, to bring iman alive in people. Because let me tell you something, when the Muslim ummah come back to the stage where they have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will be the start of rebuilding this ummah up again. We can, we can basically try and build big, big things and you know, try to make change from the top down. It's not going to happen. The people are just not willing to accept it. I mean, look, it, you, we try and go home and say to your children, you have to pray salah. Not that we encourage force, it should be with targhib. You, we can't even make our own children Muslim, let alone bring it from the top down. Okay, we'll force it upon people. So we are in a predicament now, we cannot physically force anybody. And this is what my Elias, he saw the predicament of Muslims and he said he was more in favor of starting grassroots amongst people one by one and bringing the iman alive. Look, we may agree to disagree. You may not agree with the effort. Fine. Don't. But what really pains me more than anything is when I see certain individuals and they sit there and they make it their God, they make it their a reason for existence just to slate them. But if you can spend time, do it, mashallah. If you can't, then why are you being an obstacle for other people spending time? And you know one thing which I heard one sheikh said, it was very just, very adil what he said, it was very decent. He said, look, if you cannot spend time in helping Muslim, then don't be criti- don't criticize. And if you see, look, Gamal who has perfection? Who has perfection? Nobody. Perf- who, who is perfect? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of human beings, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kamal is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the example of human beings is in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Beyond that, everyone's going to have faults, everyone's going to have nuqs. So we need to keep in mind these differences. And if you saw your brother doing something wrong, you'd say, Bhai, come on, man. With muhabbat, you would explain. But here you have people opening up YouTube channels, making it their God-given whole day purpose just to slay other people. But you're not doing nothing productive in this ummah. Salute them for the good they do. And where they need Islam, you go and make Islam. I'm not saying for one moment, this is the only thing that there is needed. Because I got to a point when I was spending time in Dawud and Tabligh, that I, my thirst was not met just by going in Jamaat. So I took admission into a madrasa. The brothers encouraged me to go. They didn't stop me from going. And Alhamdulillah, me talking to you now, I'm a product of that very effort. Do you understand? So it's not so narrow-minded and one, one-sided, very single track. No, it encourages to... Oh, this is a, like a boost for people. So when people say, Dabligi, but they don't take part in politics, or Dabligi's don't do this. Bro, what do you do? What do you, you do it then? 
the, the whole purpose of this is not politics, because you're going to have mochis, cobblers, farmers, all kinds of people in this work. Not everyone has the capability, the mental and the academic, the, the, the prowess, even the strength to be able to even deal with these things. This is an effort for an, in, and the league is about yourself. It's not about others, it's about yourself first. You connecting to Allah, and then other people. While you're there, you also connect to other people, but the number one maqsad is yourself. So this is why I chose to speak about this, because it's something which sadly people kind of, oh no, they're just like that. They're the tabligis, they're like this. Brother, if you cannot do nothing productive, don't say, you, don't, you haven't got the right to say nothing. If you are not doing nothing for this ummah, just slating people, you don't have the right. So this is why I say, rather than be a means of stopping khair, encourage the good. Kamal is with Allah. Same like other groups, same like X, Y, and Z people, but what's wrong is when we say we're right, but they're all wrong. They're all like this, and they're kafir, and they're mushrik, and they're bidatis, or something pathetic and stupid like that. To think that we have the sole monopoly on deen, that mentality needs to get scrapped. And if we point more fingers, point some at ourselves to start that. So this is why I, I've always favoured the work of da'wah, because it's, some, just, it's not judgment, it shouldn't be judgmental. You may have met the Ard al-Tabligi, but just as how one Muslim doesn't represent all of us in UK by doing a 7-7 bombing, or one blowing up a bit attempted, so-called allegedly, doing something, that, doesn't, that shouldn't bring disrepute on us, because we say our faith doesn't teach us. So just because you may have had a bit of a ruckus with one Tabligi, doesn't mean the whole fraternity and the whole people are like that. And there's no membership. So you can't say, he's part. there is no membership, there's no organisation, there's no hierarchy, it's everyone for themselves. Keep this in mind, inshallah. And the least we can do, make dua. Ya, those, uh, ya Allah, those people that are spending time, accept them. Any deficiency, remove it. But let me be a means of removing that then, inshallah. The Muslim can think holistically, we won't be so judgmental. We'll, we'll accept the good and we'll abstain from the bad. And we'll, as a brother, I will try to advise him with love about his bad. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah. May Allah inspire us.